this case is really interesting because, first of all, this patient's quite young. 38 is many standard deviations below what our median age is at diagnosis. And it, when generally when you find a pelvic mass in a woman that's 38, you think about benign conditions, first of all. Uh, you also think about non-epithelial tumors, so uh, germ cell tumors uh, and sex cord stromal tumors. However, this patient in her imaging shows some features that are very suspicious for a high-grade malignancy. So she has an omental disease uh, uh, that's um, often termed as caking. And what that means is that there's essentially a plaque that, of tumor that's essentially replaced the fat that normally is there, which would on CAT scan would ordinarily just show up as a, a kind of a, a darker gray. Uh, now it's thicker and can be seen. And then of course, then she has a pelvic mass and an elevated C125. So all these are consistent with what you would expect to see in a patient who has metastatic epithelial ovarian cancer. But those other conditions should be kept in mind. Another aspect that's quite interesting in this patient who has who is young at diagnosis, and this should go through the, any clinician's uh, or healthcare provider's mind, is that of her family history. So we see that she has no family history of breast or ovarian cancer, but it would be important to make sure that that, dis that discussion is, is thorough because it may not be in the immediate history. It may be even a generation uh, separated. Uh, and many patients sometimes have the diagnosis of a family member or had a situation where a family member actually has an abdominal cancer or, she under, or a family member may have undergone, say, a open and closed procedure and they never really identified the disease. And importantly, there may be actually a strong history of, for instance, of prostate cancer in men. And those would still be associated with this potential familial history. A patient like this who presents with what looks to be obvious metastatic disease will generally undergo a surgical procedure to remove the disease. The one caveat is that if we feel as though the disease is in a distribution that couldn't be resected completely or to a small volume as this patient ultimately turned out to have, there may be the consideration of doing what's called neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And I think that with the available data, uh, we feel that there's certainly subgroups of patients that, that probably do just as well, whether they have their surgery first or their chemo first. We do know that chemotherapy first in that neoadjuvant setting can reduce uh, not only the surgical extent that's required to get a good surgical outcome, but also the postoperative and perioperative morbidities. So that's an important consideration. But I think from this from the standpoint of establishing a diagnosis and potentially uh, develop or um, interfering with the symptomatology which the patient's experiencing, for instance, the bloating. Uh, surgery can sometimes be the best um, first approach for this. And as we can see in the case, she did have a good surgery and it appears is that her tumor volume was reduced down to a centimeter of residual.